We have up to 75 right now. Okay. Thank you everybody for joining us. Welcome to the afternoon panel of the Alaska Marine Science Symposium. As we're um, getting started and getting people into the webinar, I just wanted to point out a couple features. Um, first of all, we'll have simultaneous interpretation with this panel. And so you need to click on the globe icon at the bottom of your Zoom screen. It says interpretation and you choose either English or Russian. In the panel, attendees are in listen only mode but you can use the chat box to ask questions to the panelists. And uh, we'll be monitoring that and making sure that the moderators, moderators get the questions during the Q&A sessions. And as uh, just to let you know, this event is being live streamed on Facebook and it will be recorded and posted on the Alaska Marine Science Symposium's YouTube channel. So with that, I'll pass it off to Margaret Williams to introduce herself and the other moderators of the session. Okay, thank you, Jill, and greetings, everyone. This is uh, an exciting opportunity for us to bring together American and Russian colleagues who have been uh, studying uh, our common waters in the Bering and Beaufort Seas and um, Sea of Ahotsk as well. This seminar is hosted uh, by World Wildlife Fund and the Alaska Ocean Observing System. I am Margaret Williams, the director of World Wildlife Fund's US Arctic program and have been uh, working with many of the colleagues who are presenting today and so glad to have them. I wanted to thank especially our uh, Russian colleagues, some of whom are joining us from the middle of the night in on the uh, western side of Russia. And I also wanted to acknowledge that although we're calling this the US-Russia corner, uh, some folks have noticed that we actually have more Russians than Americans. Um, but I think that's great because it's so often oh, difficult to get, get people together and it seems more and more challenging in these days. And that perhaps is a benefit of the COVID um, impact on the Alaska Marine Science Symposium this year is that it's a little bit easier to get people together um, however, it's not that easy. We're having, um, a, there are a lot of logistics involved in getting people from so many time zones. And we also have some colleagues in very remote parts of Russia and Alaska who couldn't join us. Um, and a couple of people who are still having some technical difficulties calling in, including two of our panelists. So hopefully we can work out the bugs as we go along. Um, I also wanted to acknowledge that there are so many more topics that we could have included. We just didn't have the time or space in this agenda. Uh, but we hope to do more of these US-Russia science corners in the coming year. And we'll try to find the right venues that maybe we can connect with. But um, this is a, a great first start. Uh, again, to our speakers and to our participants, remember that we have simultaneous interpretation and you should be choosing a room at the bottom, a translation room at the bottom by, of your screen by clicking on that globe. Um, there will be time for questions and answers at the end of each short session, at the end of each block of speakers. And um, for our speakers, I wanted to please ask you to observe your 10 minute time limit. We um, will have moderators and they will give you a warning, but, but please do try to stick with your time. Now I wanted to quickly introduce our moderators. We have two wonderful moderators and I'd like to first introduce um, Molly McCammon, who will be our first moderator. Molly is now senior advisor for the Alaska Ocean Observing System, where she was the executive director for 17 years. And Molly uh, was also the founder of the Alaska Ocean Observing System. And currently, thanks to all of her efforts and her wonderful team, AOS has become a very pivotal organization in coordinating and supporting and communicating Alaska's marine science to the public. Molly is an active member of many scientific organizations. She's a past member of the National Research Council's Polar Research Board. And prior to her time with the Alaska Ocean Observing System, Molly uh, for 10 years was the director of the Exxon Valdez Oil Spill Trustees Council. So she played a huge role in helping to disperse funds which have enabled the restoration of Alaskan ecosystems. 
Our second moderator is Jackie Grebmeyer, Dr. Jackie Grebmeyer, who is a professor at the University of Maryland Center for Environmental Science. Jackie's oceanographic research includes um, or is related to pelagic benthic ecosystems. Uh, she has looked at, done groundbreaking work in documenting biological productivity in Arctic waters and sediments and looking how materials are exchanged between the sea and um, the seabed and overlying waters. Uh, Jackie is also a member of many scientific advisory boards and review committees, including the National Academy of Sciences, Polar Research Board, National Science Foundation, and many others. Uh, one of the many international research groups and efforts Jackie has participated in is RUSALCA, the Russian American Census of the Arctic. And unfortunately, RUSALCA is no longer happening, but um, I'm sure Jackie's experience in Rusalka will be relevant to our discussion today. And finally, both Jackie and Molly have been friends and colleagues and advisors to World Wildlife Fund over the years. So I thank them both for their efforts and for their help today in keeping this discussion going. So Molly, I think now the floor is yours. Yes. yes. Thank you, Margaret. Um, I appreciate that very much, and I'm pleased to be here uh, helping to um, moderate this session. I also want to acknowledge a lot of the, the staff of both AUS and World Wildlife Fund who are making this possible. Um, so especially Jill Pruitt, who has done an amazing work getting all of the, helping with all of the speakers and the logistics here on my staff. But our first session is going to focus on marine mammals. And uh, we have a number of speakers uh, two of the speakers, we have five speakers scheduled, um, and hopefully we'll hear from all five. It's a little un uncertain yet. I think this, what it shows is the challenge of getting um, speakers from even someplace that's close to us, Russia, the Chukotka, and the, the, um, the western part of Russia is very, very close to us, but it's still difficult often to access in terms of internet bandwidth and accessibility. And I think um, that is a challenge for all of us, especially as we look to the UN Decade of Ocean Science in the next 10 years on how do we increase equal access to data and internet capacity all across the Arctic. So I look forward to that. Our first speaker today is Olga Filatova. She is from Moscow State University. Um, she's a research fellow there and with Beringia National Park. She works with killer whales, humpbacks, Baird's beaked whales, and gray whales. Um, she works on different topics ranging from acoustic communication to habitat. And we're looking forward to her presentation on monitoring of cetaceans in Beringia National Park in Eastern Chukotka. So Olga, I'm gonna turn it to you. Thank you very much. Hello to everyone. I work in the Beringia National Park, and I'm going to speak a bit about our work there. Can you hear me? Beringia National Park is located in Chukotka. It is comprised of several clusters in different regions of Chukotka, but we work primarily in this region, in the Sinyavin Strait. Here, we are studying three whale species in particular, humpbacks, gray whales, and killer whales. We've been working here for the past four years, since 2017. And I will now briefly describe the results reached for each of these species. Oh, they're asking in the chat whether the English interpretation is working or not. Okay, then I will continue. Um, okay. 
Во-первых, мы выяснили, First, что... We learned that the distribution of different species in this body of water varies. The humpback whales stay primarily in the deep fjords and in the central deep water of the strait. We photograph humpbacks for individual identification according to the underside of their tail flukes. Currently, our Senyavin Strait catalog contains 153 whales. When we compare this catalog to our other catalogs from other Russian waters, then we discover encounters in other regions of Chukotka, Kamchatka, and the Commander Islands. The international system that compares catalogs using a neural network ID algorithm on the site happywhale.com found many repeat encounters with our whales in other regions, both in feeding grounds and breeding grounds. These were mostly found in the Hawaiian Islands and near Mexico. The number of humpback whales varies significantly from year to year. In 2017 and 2018, the Senyavin Strait hosted approximately 100 whales, but over the past two years, their numbers fell drastically. In 2018, we also saw a mass die-off of seabirds, which was possibly due to the same reasons as the decrease in our whale feeding clusters. Most of the whales encountered in recent years were already known to us. They were animals that returned to the Senyavid Strait year after year. The genetic analysis of mitochondrial haplotype frequencies showed similarities between the Chukotka feeding cluster and the clusters from the Aleutian Islands and breeding grounds in Mexico and near Ogasawara. Another species we are researching are gray whales. Unlike humpbacks, gray whales can mainly be found in shallow waters and don't usually venture into the fjords. We also identify gray whales by their natural markings. And to date, we have identified 85 individual whales. We found that gray whales maintain site fidelity within the body of water under examination. On this map, these lines connect the repeated encounters with one whale over the course of a season, and it's clear that the animals only travel within a few kilometers. It's a fairly atypical for such mobile creatures as baleen whales, and this is possibly due to the fact that gray whales feed on benthos, which have a higher site stability than plankton, which is the main food source for other whale species. We are also researching the effect of shipping noise on gray whales. With a reduction in Arctic ice cover and a greater use of northern sea lanes, the effect of shipping noise on whales will increase. We are carrying out experiments playing shipping noises to the whales in order to learn how whales react to different noise levels and what noise level is considered critical to them. As a result, we've discovered that even a fairly low noise level with a received level of approximately 110 decibels per one micropascal can lead to changes in the whale's behavior. In our experiment, this level of noise at times led to changes in whale activity, for example, from feeding to traveling, or changes in their speed or in the length of their breathing breaks. We also collect tissue samples from whales caught by local Chukcha and Eskimo as part of a Aboriginal whaling. This is key both for research into the whale's biology and to assess the safety of meat for human consumption. Moreover, our research region sometimes sees whales with a strong medicinal smell, the so-called stinky whales, that are unfit for human consumption. We hope that the samples collected will allow us to shed light on the origins of this phenomenon.
Yet another species we study are killer whales. In Russian waters, killer whales are segregated by habitat region. There are fish eaters or resident killer whales, which are found primarily in areas with a narrow shelf here where, where we see green. And then broad shelf and shallow waters, including in Chukotka, are home chiefly to mammal eating or transient killer whales. Here you can see it in red, red triangles. We also individually identify the killer whales through photographs. Currently, our catalog contains 25 Chukotka killer whales. The number of repeated sightings is very high. More than half of the killer whales are, that we encounter are already known to us. And this indicates that the number of killer whales in Chukotka is generally low, not more than 30 or so. Photographs also identified our killer whales in other regions, including the Chukcha Sea near Kaliuchin Island. Stable isotope analysis confirmed that Chukcha uh, killer whales are mammal eating. The level of stable nitrogen isotopes was the highest in all Russian waters. Visually, we have observed killer whales successfully hunting for various types of seals. Apart from the typical species that we see, in 2018, we encountered a species unusual for Chukotka, a right whale. For more than a week, it kept to a fjord alongside humpback whales. According to a genetic analysis, it was most likely part of the Eastern population. That population is very low in numbers and possibly it numbers only a few dozen animals. This is the northernmost encounter for this species. Over the past decade, right whales haven't been seen north of the Commander Islands in Russian waters. In the US region, the most numerous encounters occur in the eastern Bering Sea, north of the Aleutians. And this is the end of my presentation. Thank you. You were, you were quicker than I expected. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Olga, very much. Um, we do have a real time for a real quick question. If anyone does have a question for Olga now, or we can wait until the rest of the speakers. And I see one um, question here. Were there any known effects of Kamchatka's 2020 mystery spill on whales? In particular, I was wondering about the endangered West Pacific gray whale because they feed in transit near shore. Were you able to get that translated? Okay. Uh, no, uh, do you mean, are we speaking about the disaster in Kamchatka? Well, if I understand correctly, then that was not actually a spill, but it was rather it was an algal bloom. And we have yet to receive any information about how it would have affected anything to the north of Kamchatka. And Chukotka is very far north from Kamchatka. And at that time, when this was taking place in Kamchatka, Chukotka was already beginning its ice cover and there it would be hard to imagine how these algal blooms could have traveled that far north because of the ice but if we're talking about uh the pacific gray whale then the western population of these whales mostly lives and feeds in the Ahotsk sea which is a different uh, different side of Kamchatka. So it, it, this is actually not a question I can answer. It's not my speci speciality. 
Okay, thanks, Olga. We will hear more about the algal bloom um, in the next um, session of talks. And I think there was one question though, whether the right whale was had a photo identification. Were you, was there able to be a photo identification of the right whale that was seen? Yes, he was identified, added it to the catalog, and we compared him with our Russian catalogs and other international catalogs, and we couldn't find him in any catalog, so it's a new whale. All right, thank you, thank you. We'll talk more about um, noise and acoustics after our next um, couple of speakers. Um, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Kate Stafford. She's a senior principal oceanographer with the Applied Physics Lab at University of Washington. She uh, focuses her research primarily on using passive acoustic monitoring to examine migratory movements, geographic variation, and physical drivers of marine mammals, um, especially large whales. So today, Kate is going to talk about acoustic detections of marine mammals in the Bering Strait region. So welcome, Kate. Thanks, Molly. And uh, thanks, Olga, very much for an excellent presentation. Um, I'm going to talk today, as Molly said, about using passive acoustics to listen for marine mammals in the Bering Strait and in the Pacific Arctic in general. And uh, we're interested in doing this because, of course, um, marine mammals are vital sources of food security and cultural identity for native Arctic peoples, whether they are on the Russian side uh, or the US side. Marine mammals can be considered as ecosystem sentinels um, because they are relatively easy to monitor over long time scales. Um, and of course, underwater sound is a really good way to listen for ships changes in the atmosphere and marine mammals. And this has become even more critical, I think, just in the past couple of weeks, um, when in fact we hear that a number of LNG vessels have been transiting through the Bering Strait in January. And I didn't, uh, I had to have my slides in before that happened, but I would argue that's something we really need to think about because these animals are migrating through critical habitat for Arctic marine mammals like bowhead and beluga whales in the middle of winter. So one of the advantages of passive acoustics is that it allows for year round detection, even in poor weather, heavy ice, you can hear animals much further than you can see them. And fortunately, different species make distinctly different signals. Um, and this, we, get, we can also get uh, essentially a time series of ambient noise. So that means all the biological and non-biological contributors to underwater sound. And we can do this at multiple sites in the Arctic year round. Um, what we don't get from passive acoustic monitoring is some of the information that Olga just presented, the number of individuals that are present or whether or not different individuals occur at the same time. So what I'm going to talk to you about very briefly today are some data from hydrophones, which are underwater microphones that we deployed on oceanographic moorings, uh, some as part of the North Pacific Research Board's Integrated Ecosystem Research Program, uh, but also some as that were initially deployed as part of RISALCA, the Russian-US Long-Term Census of the Arctic, and that have been in place north of Bering Strait for almost a decade now. And the main driver of listening underwater is to get information on ambient noise levels, to hear who's where, when, so what species, both Arctic and subarctic species, occur in the different areas, and potentially see if we can hear changes in the climate by hearing changes in the migratory patterns of marine mammals. And the overarching goal of this is to report back to local communities on the health of their ecosystem, um, provide information on new species. Uh, Olga just mentioned right whales, but also think about residency time on Arctic species. 
So some of the hypotheses of this study are that we would see a northward shift of subarctic marine mammals. And by that, I'm talking about killer whales, uh, fin whales, and humpback whales. We might see them spending more time in the Pacific Arctic. We think that sea ice cover might influence the both the northbound and southbound timing of Arctic marine mammals, specifically cetaceans, and in this case, uh, beluga whales and bowhead whales. And then we're also listening for changes in ambient noise levels in the open water season due to both increased winds because there's less sea ice and increased shipping. But as I started my talk, uh, we may now need to listen for these changes in the middle of winter. So I'm just going to briefly present data from one year from five locations in the Arctic. Um, we put hydrophones out in the Northern Bering Sea. So to each side of St. Lawrence Island, uh, a little bit further north in the Strait of Anadir, north of the Diomedes. And then as an outlier, we also have an instrument that's up in the Beaufort Sea. I should say that all of these instruments are on the US side of the border. Um, they sample data up to eight kilohertz, which is plenty of bandwidth to record all of the marine mammals we expect to hear. And then because there are so many species making sounds all at once, um, each acoustic data file was visually and orally examined uh, to determine the sources of noise, whether the noise is ships or animals. But what I'm gonna to talk to you about today is mostly just the marine mammals. If we want to look at uh, a year underwater uh, at N4, which was this site right here, you can see that the soundscape varies quite a bit. You've got wind events. Uh, you've got the really clear pattern of singing bowhead whales in the winter and bearded seals in the spring. Um, and then you've also got instrument noise because it's a very dynamic area with lots of currents that move the instruments about. But this gives us a very big picture of what our noise levels look like. If we dive deeper into the data, we can look at the occurrence of subarctic species and Arctic species. So this plot is showing you three different species, humpback whales on the top, killer whales in the middle and fin whales on the bottom. And these are the acoustic detections by week for each of these five locations. So the darker blue colors means that there are more whale calls during that week. And a couple of things that, that I'd like you to take home from this. First of all, uh, even now, we still are not getting these subarctic species, the humpbacks, killer whales, and fin whales, up in the, the, the Western Beaufort Sea. Uh, they tend to be restricted currently, although this is changing. Uh, and there is a talk, um, I think there's going to be a talk tomorrow at the AMSS on killer whales in the Chukchi. But what you see in general is that we've got all of these subarctic species north of Bering Strait, often in the case of humpback whales and fin whales, through December and almost into January. And this is a change we think from past years, and we think this change is due to decreases in seasonal sea ice. Sea ice tends to exclude animals that have a dorsal fin because it can damage them, uh, makes them hard to, to escape ice entrapment. But particularly, um, this N4 area, which is north of St. Lawrence Island, appears to be a real hot spot for all of these subarctic species for much of the year, except for the dead of winter. If we want to look at Arctic species, uh, you can see it's a very different picture. We are getting Arctic species as we would expect in the Bering Sea, primarily in the winter and early spring. They are the only species that we hear up in the Beaufort Sea. Um, up at the top, you can see the calls of bowhead whales are heard not quite year round, but much of the year in the Beaufort Sea. Um, beluga whales show a very similar pattern. 
but it's really down in the Bering Strait region in northern Bering Sea that we know is a wintering area for bowhead whales and beluga whales, as well as bearded seals and walrus. And that's where we're hearing these animals almost every day of every week for a good five month period. Um, particularly if you think about these two areas, which are N2 and N4, these, these bottom lines, um, this is the area where those LNG ships just passed through two weeks ago. The other thing to notice here is that there are geographic and seasonal differences in when and where these species occur. Um, N1, which is here, is actually to the east of St. Lawrence Island. And although we get a fair number of bearded seals and walrus there, uh, it doesn't tend to be as important for bowhead whales or beluga whales. So even within a relatively small area of the Northern Bering Sea, we see geographic variation among who is where when. And this is actually important in terms of designing shipping lanes and what seasons we want to think about shipping lanes and whether we need to consider imp imposing either restrictions during times of year that are important for these marine mammals or potentially restrictions on ship speeds when we know that animals are in the area. And so we can get this big broad picture of the occurrence of Arctic and subarctic species essentially by listening year round. And that is all I have for now, Molly. So if I've got time, I'm happy to take any questions. Otherwise, we can wait for the panel. Thanks, Kate. Um, I think uh, there was one question here. Um, did you have any North Pacific right whale detection? There weren't any that I felt comfortable identifying 100% as North Pacific right whales, but we did hear some very interesting upsweeps and gunshots that are possibilities. Um, I sent some of those over to the folks at the Marine Mammal Lab who've been doing a lot of work on North Pacific right whale acoustics in the Bering Sea. And they couldn't be 100% certain. And again, that, that does underline the idea that really the, the best way to go about monitoring uh, marine mammals in this area is a combination of the methods that Olga uses and that I use. So a combination of visual and acoustic data. Great, thank you. <clears throat> We're gonna go on now to our next speaker that we hope we can access. Um, this is uh, Dr. Denise Latovka, uh, who is an expert with the government of the Chukotka Autonomous Region. Um, he's a specialist on cetacean populations, um, belugas, gray and bowhead whales, and marine mammal ecology changes. And if we can access him, which we hope, we're having a little bit of trouble with internet access, um, uh, he will be speaking on cetacean populations and distributions. Denise, can you um, hear us? Are you able to come on? And if you are, you may be muted. Um, on, uh, He's going to be speaking through my phone. And, but if you could please, well, he, he's planning on speaking English. So just uh, wanted to let everybody know that uh, I would need to be included in the English room. Can you hear me? So could someone please, for some reason, everything is turned off on my screen. I can't, um, I can't use my keyboard. Could you add me into the English booth, please? I don't believe we can do that, Alexander. I think you have to do it on your end. Well, why don't you speak Russian then? Well, I'll try then. 
as you wish. Uh, have traditionally hunted whales and other marine mammals for several thousand years. Uh, scientific support is prerequisite uh, for the allocation of Aboriginal whales quota for Russia. The largest uh, national village in Chukotka is Lorik, where traditionally the most whales are hunted. So it was chosen for research that has been going on here for almost uh, 50 years. Number of grey whales in, in Michigansky Bay was about uh, 15 per day in 2020, and uh, a multi annual level, firstly from uh, 1999, uh, showed a tiny elevation within 30 years period and uh, uh, of coastal counts. Distribution of, of whales annually from east to west and from coastal lines further to the sea. And back. Chukotka natives consume in the tanks and meat of whales, walruses, and seals. Uh, the Russian state's uh, sanitary, epidemiological, and hygienic requirements are controlling the level of toxic elements of arsenic, cadmium, mercury, and others in the marine mammals, tissues, and organs. Uh, lead and mercury had the lowest concentration levels in the tested animal tissues and organs in the Michigan Bay. The highest concentration of uh, arsenic and cadmium were detected in animals' kidneys, irrespective to sex and age of animals. The levels of arsenic and mercury were uh, significantly higher in the liver of animals, which are regulating the elements content less in muscles and much more, redistributing them between organs. Um, the concentrations of arsenic, cadmium, mercury, and lead uh, in the samples uh, of grey and beluga whales did not exceed the um, MPL, uh, the permitted level. The cadmium concentration exceeded the MPL only twice at 58 uh, in liver, uh, at 58 percent percent in liver of stinky grey male in 2008 and at 15 percent from permitted level in 2015 in edible female's liver. In Genius. 2010, the seven exceeding the MPL in liver of grey whales. The lead concentration exceeded the MPL three times in stinky whales, organs, and only in uh, uh, one and two at four times in liver and two times in kidney of male, and three at four times in also in edible male kidney. Uh, the multiple excess concentrations of cadmium and lead in the liver and kidney might be one of the reasons of stinky grey whales phenomena, which must be better studied. Our investigation uh, shown that most valuable products like meat and blubber of uh, all studied animals and even of stinky whales are about edible as the toxic elements. Denise, проси, проси перевести. Denise, can you ask them what slide? Could you tell me which slide we need to be on right now? Oh, we don't have the time. We don't have time. Organic chloride pesticides in uh, organs of grey whale was up to, uh, to 9 milligram per gram of lipid weight. Uh, which is lower of the MPL, recently conducted an analysis of three samples from Green World in Carcasses Worship in the Western Church Sea confirmed that uh, insignificant OCPs concentration in Green World organs. Uh, the maximum OCP concentration uh, in the Lucas from the Western Bering Sea uh, and the White Sea was respectively three and four, nine, and three and eight. Uh, milligram per gram lipids, which is lower of the MPL. Analysis of three samples uh, from the Western Bed in uh, 2017 uh, confirmed the insignificant less than two uh, milligram per gram lipids. Uh, um, LCP, uh, concentration in Duluk uh, organs, which is from three to four times higher in European Arctic. Food composition in uh, 82 grey whales from Michigan Bay was analyzed. Animals of uh, 12 taxonomic 
groups were built in good courses of Wales and antipodes and uh, polyheads uh, prevailed in, uh, in biomass and frequency of uh, occurrence. The comparison of the grey whales feeding in 2009 and 1999 displayed that the taxonomic composition of eaten animals remained the same, but the sizes of uh, the groups changed. Of course, we are also trying to use most modern techniques and remote methods uh, in our research for the idea of grey whales in Michigansky Bay in 2013-15, uh, and identifying 80 whales. For the idea in uh, Energy Liman, and identifying about uh, 440 mm -hmm. adult and 72 sub adult belugas in 2013-17. Analysis of 34 billion samples from harvested uh, in Chukota grey whales has shown that stress hormone cortisol concentrate regardless of animal sex, but there is an increasing trend of cortisol level in more uh, distal billions, as well as we found some significant negative correlation between uh, the level of cortisol in the same segments of billions and the animal size. The average level of progesterone in the blood serum of image gray whales was about 0 0.4 and testosterone uh, was about uh, 0 0.6 nanogram per milliliter. Such low concentrations were associ associated with the age of the whales that have not yet reached puberty. For the first time in Russia, data was obtained on the level of reproductive hormones in the bulkhead whale balloons, which allow the constructing Changes in hormone level during the life of the animal concentrations were determined and ranged for, uh, for progesterone from uh, 16 to 4,000 nanogram per gram and for testosterone from 1 to 8 nanogram per gram. This study shows a sharp increase of, uh, in testosterone levels in an animal aged about 9 years, which uh, we associate with the onset of puberty in the male. Further, genetic analysis of those uh, samples is required to confirm the sex of an animal and uh, to study the level of stress hormone cortisol to ev evaluate our interpretation of changes in the level of progesterone in whales. The investigation of tissues from 53 landed grey whales in, uh, of Chukotka for trichemilose was conducted in 2006, 10 and 17. The grey whale samples were negative to trichinella. The infestation of uh, walruses was uh, 1.4 in 2006. In 2020, in the Severex of Institute, the serum positivity uh, to trick pathogens, taxoplasma, trichinella, and candida was determined for serum of 21 grey whales and for Pacific walruses, which were harvested in Chukotka uh, at 2018 uh, 19. Two grey whales found positive to taxoplasma, and a grey whale was positive to candida. Also, two walruses were also uh, positive to candida. Both species were negative to trichinol. Also, this year, an analysis of 30 insects from uh, 13 grey whales was carried out for the first time in Russia. The absence of skin grey whales uh, during coastal counts and harvest monitoring the good body conditions and the bile prey content in the whale stomachs, and as well as other research in 2013. Uh, 20 indirectly indicate that the existing Aboriginal grey whales hunting has no negative impact to its population and eating conditions in Chukotka waters. Thank you. So. Hello. Thank you, Denise. Uh, thank you for that. We appreciate that. Um, we're going to move on to our next speaker, who is Anatoly Kochnev. Yes, Lucia, uh, please, Lucia, some. Can you mm -hmm. hear? Can you hear? Yes, I do. I can hear you. Yes, we can hear you. Um, and Anatoly is the leading researcher for Beringia National Park, um, and he's going to be speaking to us about walrus, the population status, and research in Russia. Go ahead, Anatoly. Uh, 
and my main work is studying the biological issues in the north for uh, my uh, scientific academy, the Russian Academy of Sciences. As early as in the 1990s, well-known Russian pinnipeds expert Gennady Finiseev first put forth the hypothesis that shifts in ice conditions directly impact the range within which Pacific walrus habitats are distributed. But it was only in the 2000s that the massive decrease in ice cover and climate change became apparent. Then new works began to be published, including those that I published uh, in 2004, for example, and my American colleagues also wrote about the effects of climate change on Pacific walrus. In 2019, a landmark event took place. The TV series Our Planet was released on Netflix and with contributions from WWF. It was widely discussed, especially uh, the part of the film showing the demise of walruses falling from cliffs. And on the internet, what became clear was the fact that a significant proportion of the general public had no understanding of how climate change and these deaths were linked. And also the links with the coastal haulouts and a lack of ice cover. Climate skeptics used this and published quite a few articles, especially on the website Polar Bear Science, which in which they expressed their doubts that oh, walruses were being affected by ice loss and climate changing, climate change. And, oh, oh wait a minute, I think I just got ahead of myself. Well, one of the key arguments that these skeptics had was the fact that walruses had always hauled out in the Chukcha Sea. And therefore, the ice loss had no effect on this process. And it became clear that we needed a more thorough analysis, one that would clearly illustrate the effect of ice cover reduction on the use of onshore haulouts by walruses. So what did I do? To accomplish this, I collected all the information on Pacific walrus haulouts available to me from Russian sources, including publications, manuscripts, and on this slide you can see the list. I took a look at 136 articles. I created a large database. It included 108 land haulout places that had been noted beginning in uh, 1983 and through 2019. I then uh, aggregated the data by decade. And here I want to show how the use of fallouts was changed from decade to decade. The oldest data we have is very sporadic. And the most in-depth research into walrus haulouts began in the 1930s, especially in the second half of the 1930s, when the ice situation, so the ice became a lot weaker in this area, and walrus were very active and spread out along the Bering Coast and alongside the Chukchi Sea. I wanted to speak in depth about 
how the situation changed over each decade, but unfortunately we don't have enough time, so I'm going to try to do this as quickly as possible. So the 1940s and the 50s, the number of call-outs decreased sharply due perhaps to an increase in fishing in the 1950s, but it could also be true that during these years there wasn't very much information because there was a war and uh, no one was really interested in walrus. Therefore, uh, registered haul-outs in the 40s and 50s were few and far between. But in the 1960s, we began to carry out aerial photo surveys of coastal haul-outs, and there was also a warming that began in the 60s, and we found quite a significant number of haul-outs in the north, on the Chukcha Sea, and in the Bering Strait. And in the 1970s, we saw cooler temperatures, and they began to move their haul-outs to the south, to the north of Kamchatka, and this continued into the 1980s. In the 1980s, we began to use satellite images to monitor Arctic ice distribution, and that way we were able to compare the shifts in walrus coastal haul-outs to changes in ice cover in the Arctic seas. In the 1990s, it began to warm again, and we can see this is the first decade when it was clear that the ice cover was indeed decreasing. And little by little, we saw fewer walrus to the south. The walruses began to appear more and more often in the Chukchi Sea area. In over the last two decades, no uh, walrus remained in Kamchatka, and the largest coastal haul-outs were registered at the south of the Chukchi Sea and along the Bering Strait. This makes sense because it was in this region between Cape Tertakemen in Kamchatka and Cape Hope in Alaska. This is where there's a significant uh, number of mollusks that the walrus feed on. There's a high concentration here, and therefore this is where the walrus found themselves concentrating. So this is work that we are continuing today, and I only spoke very briefly about it today. To continue our studies and our research, what we would need is similar data from Alaska, and we'd be able to combine it with our data from Chukotka. We would also want to enlist a sea ice expert who would be able to calculate the average ice cover area over each decade and would it also be helpful to enlist a statistician to carry out a quantitative analysis of correlations between the summer fall area and distribution of ice and the use of various coastal habitats by walrus. Well, this is all I have. I wanted to say as much as I could as quickly as possible. If there are any questions, then I'm ready to answer them. Thank you, Anatoly. That was great. Um, we are going to um, try for our next speaker, our last speaker, and hopefully this will work. Um, we're going to be uh, speaking with Tatiana Menenka. Uh, she is um, in a, a small village in Yukatka that does not have internet. And so she is going to be speaking through a phone, through a phone, and we're trying to see if this all works. But um, Tatiana is, um, uh, the, has been leading the polar bear patrol team since 2006. And um, this, uh, the village she lives in is one of the settlements in Chukotka that is most visited by polar bears. So she is uh, on the, the leading edge of, of a lot of polar bear work. So can we go ahead and see if this works?
Alexander, you have the should have the controls. Tatiana, go ahead. Tatiana, please go ahead. First slide, please. Hello, dear colleagues. Thank you for inviting me to this event. My presentation today is entitled Conservation Management in the Most Visited Polar Bear Village in Jakutka. Second slide, please. Our national village is called Rirkaipi, and it is on the coast right across from Wrangell Island. In 2007, when polar bears began to approach our village more often, we organized the polar bear patrol. And it's been working since then. It, it is composed of three people currently. And you can see on the screen, our primary support is from the WWF and our local administration. Next slide, please. So why is our village famous? Well, recently it's because of the number of polar bears seen near our village, as well as the significant Pacific walrus haulouts in the area. Both of these events are due to climate change and both the walruses and the polar bears are now uh, hauling out on Kazevnik Cape, Cape Kazevnik, because it's only a couple of kilometers from our village. That is why this is an issue for us. According to the memory of my ancestors, in the summer, the sea was always covered in ice. And this is why walruses and polar bears remained on the ice and not on land. Fourth slide, please. For example, over the past two years, in the same exact month in December, near our village in 2019, we saw approximately 60 polar bears. In 2020, we noted approximately 30 polar bears. They stayed close to the village for approximately two weeks in 2019. And in 2020, they only stayed for three days. Well, what's interesting is that both, for both of these years, they arrived almost uh, on the exact day. And we think this is because both the bears came to us from Wrangell Island. No other village has seen so many bears over the past few years. Next slide, please. Near our village of Rirakaipa, bears can be seen from the end of July through December, and even sometimes they can be found until January. It all depends on how quickly the sea ice cover forms. This slide shows that from five to 10 bears per, per month can be seen. They primarily feed on walrus that have died. And when there are many walrus carcasses, we see quite a few bears near our village. Next slide, please. Unfortunately, it's not always easy to deal with the bears. Sometimes our polar bear patrol has had to chase bears away from the village, from kindergartens, from schools, and from other border areas in the village. This is because we are located right on the coast. That's why we have no choice. We have to deal with the bears because they walk along the coast and the coast means they come near our village. So 
we will chase them away. Our patrol chases them away. Currently, if somebody calls us and asks us to chase a bear away, then we'll arrive. Everyone in the village has our phone number and they can call us. And when they see quite a few bears near the village, then we'll organize a uh, monitoring system next to the schools and the kindergartens where someone is always on guard. And then every hour or every half hour, we will inspect around each of the schools and the kindergartens to make sure that there are no bears uh, anywhere in our village. Next slide, please. When there is a panic or a stampede in the haul out, then unfortunately quite a few walrus die and their carcasses remain close to our houses and this attracts polar bears. Therefore, we try to immediately or as quickly as possible to remove these walrus carcasses to an area that we have des designated as a polar bear feeding area. So when they're all on Kajevnik, uh, Cape Kajevnik, then they're further away from our village. And it, so if they're all uh, located or co uh, collected in that area, then we're doing our job. Next slide, please. Last year, we received a drone that allows us to monitor the number of, of polar bears, the number of walruses. And this drone also allows us to uh, minimize the disturbance to animals in their habitats. So this has been extremely valuable to our work. Next slide, please. Our children are already forced to live in a reality where Polar bears are close by, and from the very beginning of childhood, we teach our children about these predators. And this is something that the Polar Bear Patrol takes upon itself. We will go to schools, to after-school clubs, and we explain to the children how we work, how our patrol works, and also how the bears might act, their behavior, and how the children should act. Next slide, please. And of course, we work with the regional administration in close cooperation. They have been recently been helping us quite a bit with resources and coordination. They've been helping to clean up the coast uh, clean up the walrus carcasses. And if there are a significant number of polar bears, then they'll help us more significantly in coordinating our activities. Next slide, 11th slide, please. The results of our work are that over the past few years, we have prevented all conflict situations between humans and polar bears, not a single person in Rirkaipe has been injured and no polar bears have been shot. We have also gathered a significant number of uh, amount of data about polar bears. Next slide, please. Well, this is the end of my speech. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Tatiana. Uh, very much. Um, while we have you online, are there any questions for Tatiana about polar bears? And you can write them in the chat real quickly. We have 10 minutes of discussion time here. And I should tell you most of the this special session, special panel is two and a half hours long. So we have time um, built in for questions and discussion. Um, and we do have one question here about, is there any harvest or hunting of the polar bears? And Alexander, do you need to, to uh, uh, 
be the go-between. If we're speaking of hunting, I heard the question. Is hunting approved or polar bear hunting, is this allowed? No, of course, hunting is not allowed, but only in, in those critical situations where there's a threat or when a polar bear won't leave the village, then in those cases, we do everything possible to chase the bear off. And we haven't had a situation where we have had to kill a bear in, since we've begun our work. So no, we haven't had that type of a situation, but of course, go ahead. How many conflicts with polar bears were there before um, the polar bear patrol was established? Well, actually, before we began to carry out our work as the polar bear patrol, there were two instances where there were conflicts where humans were injured by bears. There is a, a young girl and a young man who were hurt, but after the organization, after we organized our polar bear patrol, no injuries have been, have occurred since then. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna go back to two uh, questions that were early on um, during Olga's, um, Dr. Filat, Filatova's um, presentation. And those questions were, which species of whales were responding to the vessel noise? Um, and can you tell us a bit more about your playback of ship noises? So two questions, which species of whales were responding to the vessel noise? And a little bit more about your playback of ship noises. So Olga. Well, we played the noise, noise only to gray whales because we weren't taking a look at all species. We were carrying out an experiment specifically with gray whales because they're an Arctic species that might be the most affected by the opening of Northern uh, shipping routes. And our experiment was as follows. We chose one gray whale that was apart from other whales. And we first observed the whale without playing any of the noise for at least half an hour. We noted each dive and we noticed how far he would travel and how deep and so on. And so we wrote out these observations in detail and then we played the shipping noise for approximately five minutes through an underwater speaker. And then we would observe the whales activities at least for half an hour uh, sometimes we even observed over the course of an hour an hour and a half and then we would compare the behavior of the whale before we played the shipping noise and after so that was our i see there's another question about uh the strange whale meat this is a well-known issue, that of so-called stinky whales. Yes, these are whales that uh, smell strain and they can lead to food poisoning in some situations. Some whales smell a bit stronger and some smell less. So this isn't something we can say specifically what is happening. Sometimes your stomach will be upset. Sometimes you'll notice it in your throat. You'll have some sort of an effect from these whales, but we haven't really defined where it comes from. Are there any other questions? There's one more question. I think 
this is a question to all of the panelists about uh, fossil fuel companies and emissions, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and are we sharing uh, research about the linkage between um, uh, fossil fuels and greenhouse emissions? But this might be beyond the scope of this discussion here, but, um, but thank you for uh, sharing that. Um, I guess I would ask a question of all of the panelists. If you could work with your colleagues easily between the US and Russia, what research would you wish that you could do now if it was easy to do? What would be your priorities? Hey, Molly, this is Kate. Um, of course, ahead, my, Kate. my priority is sort of shows my bias. I, I think it would be incredibly important to get hydrophones along the Chukotka coast and even up around by Wrangell Island and both listen to ship noise, but also listen to marine mammals there because certainly again from the Rysalka program, when we were allowed to do work in Russian waters on the Kromov, uh, there was a, a clear difference between the east and west sides of the Chukchi Sea in that the biodiversity seemed a lot higher uh, and biodiversity and abundance of different marine mammal species was higher along the Russian coast. And of course, the oceanography is very different. And what about our Russian colleagues? What would be your priorities for collaborative research across the, with no boundary there? <laughs> I agree with Kate. It would be extremely interesting to install these hydrophones along the Russian coast. And this is something that we're working on. We're working to uh, get the approval from authorities to install these hydrophones. And we hope that in the near future, we'll be able to do so. And Olga, would you be able to share the data if you did get those hydrophones out there? Easily share data. So Molly, I would chime in and say what's more important is maybe not so much sharing the data, but that, that our Russian colleagues get to collect the data and publish it and exploit it. And, and by publishing it, they're sharing the data. Hmm. Thanks, Kate. And I think Anatoly wanted to add to that as well. Uh, no, yeah. So I'm well, in my report, I already said what I would like to see. I would want similar analysis to be carried out on the walrus haulouts in Alaska. And it also look looking for people who would be able to help us to uh, carry out a quantitative analysis of ice cover over the past decades. So yeah, what I'd like to do is combine the data from Alaska and Russia. So I'm looking for uh, someone to collaborate with me on this. And I said that during my presentation. Thank you, Anatoly. Um, I think that's being echoed by others in the chat to, um, to do that. There's also a question, and I don't know if you feel comfortable answering it, but do you think that the shipping routes through um, the Bering Strait um, and the areas to be avoided um, are sufficient to protect marine mammals? Does anyone want to answer that? So, so Molly, I'll, I'll jump in here a little bit and say that given the narrowness of Bering Strait on, on either side of the strait, there's not really a lot of wiggle room for where shipping routes can go. I think probably what's most important is to think about slowing ships and th 
thinking about areas to be avoided. And again, I was the, I think it's now four or five uh, liquid natural gas vessels have gone through Bering Strait this month. And if you look at the ship tracks, you know, they're all going right by St. Lawrence Island and that's where bowhead whales winter. So from that perspective, and this was, I don't know why it was unexpected. I just wasn't really expecting it. Uh, from that perspective, oh, and of course we should say that the, the polar sea or the polar star, the US Coast Guard cutter also did a winter mission. But I don't think we're really talking about protecting these wintering areas because I think we've sort of assumed that there would always be plenty of ice. So I think that needs to be part of the conversation now. Thanks, Kate. Um, and we have one com more comment, um, and this is the last comment, and then we have to move on. Um, and from Tatiana uh, Manenka, uh, wanted to make one last comment. What did you think? Please, Tanya. So there was a question about what we would like to gain from cooperation with Alaska and the WWF. There are quite a few conversations currently about opening polar bear hunting seasons and how to organize polar bear hunts. And specifically in our area and with our patrol, we see bears that are not in good condition, not in good health, they're very skinny. It's not that they're doing well, they're coming on shore very skinny, very underfed. So there are those who think that since we're seeing so many polar bears on the coasts, that means the, the population is growing and therefore we can open up a hunting season. But what I would like is for us to join our efforts to carry out a scientific survey to assess how many bears there are so that we'd be able to have a more accurate count and so that we could have a uh, an appropriate response to opening a hunting season for polar bears, whether this is something that we actually want to do or not, if it's something that's feasible or not, this is what we'd like to do. Thank you for that um, last comment. And just wanted to note um, that uh, as a follow-up to Kate from Kathy Kulitz, who works with seabirds here in Alaska, he uh, had a follow-up about the high abundance of marine mammals along the Russian coast that seabirds may also be more abundant there offshore than off Alaska's coasts. And there could be a westward shift in some species. So she hopes that if there are marine mammal surveys, that also seabird surveys are included as well. So with that, I am going to turn this over now to my um, co-moderator, Jackie Grebmeyer, who's going to be introducing the next speakers. And um, the next speaker I know is going to be Tatiana Orlova, who is going to be speaking on behalf of uh, Tatiana Morozova. So um, uh, Jackie, do you yes. want to take it from here? Uh, thanks, Molly, so much for doing that introduction. Um, and uh, the only thing is I don't have a bio for uh, Tatiana or Lova, so I'd be happy to her if she could introduce herself a bit, but I w do know that the presentation will be on uh, harmful algal blooms and other stressors. This session is covering that. And so with that, I think uh, Tatiana, I'll let you begin your presentation. Thank you, Jekin. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you for inviting me to participate in this conference. My name is Tatiana Arlova, and I am a senior research scientist at the National Scientific Center of Marine Biology, which is the far eastern branch of the Russian Academy of Science in Vladivostok. And I also am the head of a group in a lab on marine microbiota, 
And over the past 30 years, we have been studying uh, phytoplankton in the far eastern seas of Russia. And we are here, of course, taking a look at harmful algal blooms and those organisms that lead to uh, so-called red tides. Uh, let's see, can I move my slides forward? Yes. So I'm going to start by talking about the event, of course, that took place in Kamchatka last year. And then the presentation will speak a bit about harmful algal blooms and which groups in, we see currently in the Bering and Chukchi Seas. So what were our results from our research? As you know, that the red tide in Kamchatka, which we called the bear tide to make it similar to the Alaska bear tide that we saw, or the beer tide rather, that was seen um, in 2015 in Alaska. So this is a similar event, one that was caused by a similar dinoflagellate. So here we can see on this slide, the samples that we took beginning on the 4th of October. And these samples were taken through to the 20th of October. And this is the analysis that we carried out. According to our research, we established that the dominating species of phytoplankton here during this period along the Kamchatka coast were dinoflagellates, specifically the Karenia species. And as you can see, there were several different species here. This is the concentration that we can see on the 4th of October, which is 105,000 uh, cells per liter, which is very high. Here's the 12th of October, and you can see the results of our research that was carried out at the southern tip of Kamchatka on the, the eastern coast. And here, Karenia was dominating in all of our samples. Approximately 90% of our phytoplankton population was dominated by this particular species. And their concentration was up to half a million per liter, half a million cells per liter. On the 13th of October, our samples showed that the bloom continued. And in Saranaya Bay, we saw the maximum concentration of this species, 622,000 cells per liter. This is, of course, a red tide. Such a high concentration of organisms leads to these red tides. And this slide, you can see the biomass of dinoflagellates along the coast. You can see the significant number. Here we measured this species. And it, when we were taking a look at the biomass here, we compared it with the results of our satellite monitoring of the concentration of these uh, dinoflagellates. And here you can see that this organism was producing up to seven and a half tons of biomass per square kilometer per day. And this, of course, is a very significant concentration. Our genetic studies that were carried out by our organization, our center, showed that the Karenia that bloomed along the coast of Kamchatka was almost 100% related to the species Karenia siliformis that led to harmful algal blooms along the Chilean coast. There was a 100% uh, link to the Chilean bloom that took place in 1999. And to the species that was found in Chile 
in 2018 that led to a significant red tide that also took place on an uninhabited coast. Uh, several hundreds of kilometers of uninhabited coastline saw millions of marine animals uh, that died and were thrown up on the beaches. This was due to a significant spread of Karenia celliformis, whose genetic makeup was exactly 100% the same as that we found off the coast of Kamchatka. The studies that we carried out on these cysts and the cyst abundance in marine recent sediments, we collected in these four locations during that period from the 22nd to the 30th of October. It showed that the cyst of Karenia, as you can see here on the slide, this is a photograph of the cyst. What's extremely interesting for us here, although it's not surprising, this would be the rather high number of Alexandria uh, catenella that we can see in this sediment. This is a species that is well known by all specialists who are examining uh, harmful algal blooms as it is the primary species that has been behind the uh, toxic blooms throughout the world. It has a very high level of toxins. And if we take a look at this slide, here we can say the spread of cyst abundance for the Exandrium cantonella. Um, we can see it in recent marine sediments on both sides of the Bering Sea, as well as Kamchatka and the Alaskan side as well. And here we can see what the concentration is in each region. What does this mean? This means that red tides, those that we histori historically and regularly see in these areas, they are danger, not only for marine mammals, but also for the ecosystem as a whole, because these dinoflagellates and other uh, phytoplankton are essential elements in the uh, food cycle here. So here there is a danger throughout the region of these red tides. So this is an example of the amount, the abundance of Alexandrium cantonella. Here we can see data that was uh, that was gathered by uh, Moscow State University last year in August. Here we can see a red tide in Chukotka with 44 million cells per liter, according to our colleagues' data. And then in the Alutersky Bay in 2017, the Kamchatka uh, Scientific Center uh, carried out a monitoring program in this region. And in 2017, they saw a concentration of 1.3 million cells per liter and yet another red tide. So conclusion, I of course wish to note here that we need to continue our research uh, identifying the species and where they are located and how toxic they are and learning more about the dinoflagellates that uh, lead to red tides in this region. And of course, we hope and we're looking to the future to a possibility of carrying out a joint research project with our colleagues from the United States because we have the same region and we have the same species and the problems are the same and cooperation here was something that we had uh, in the past. It was very beneficial for Russia because all the methods that we learned to be able to study the HABs in, in our waters was 
in great part due to our American colleagues. So I have uh, great optimism. I hope that these collaborations will continue in the future. Uh, this is the end of my presentation. Thank you. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you very much, Tatiana, make me interpret it, yes. for an, an excellent presentation. Waiting. Um, we're waiting for questions to come in, but I do have one. Do you take uh, environmental measurements at the same time you're doing these collections? And are you seeing changes in those stressors that could influence the, the impacts on the harmful algal bloom? Can we hold on for just a second, Molly? We're trying to get the uh, uh, no, we'll interpreter back on. Um, the red tides and tabs that we see throughout the world, of course, they are being studied What's most important and what's taking place right now is the change in the dominating species. We're seeing new species that weren't seen before, or we can see an increase in the intensity of the red tide itself. This is something that we see that could of course be linked to a significant number of different issues, including anthropogenic issues, but also if we're talking about such uh, significant effects on the body of water, of course, first and foremost, it is climate change. We're seeing this in hydrology. We're seeing this in the changes in uh, tides along the coasts. All this has led to a significant increase in these phenomena. Of course, we need to control them. We need to to try and mitigate these events. We can't prevent them, but if we study them and understand them better, then that will allow us to mitigate the dangerous effects of these tides. So that that's my opinion. Great, thank, thank you so much. And there are a couple other questions. We'll bring them up in the open sessions such as impacts on marine mammals and uh, time series changes. But now we'll move on to the next speaker, which is uh, Dr. Don Anderson from Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute. And he's a senior scientist there at the in the biology uh, department. And he is uh, the director actually of the Cooperative Institute of North America. He will be speaking about uh, research on harmful algal blooms in, in the Arctic. So Don. All right, well, th thank you, Jackie. I'm, do I have control? There we go, there are the arrows. So what we are going to cover right now is a continuation of what uh, Tanya just went through, but from the US side, uh, I want to talk about the harmful algal bloom problem in particular in the, uh, about in the Alaskan Arctic. And I want to highlight the, some just wonderful opportunities for US Russian uh, collaboration. So by way of background, you've heard a little bit about harmful algal blooms, but let's give you a, a little more detail. Um, there's no question that these are, we call them HABs or HABs. They, they are a, a global problem. They're increasing in frequency and in geographic extent. And I think that's the, the, the expansion we're talking about here is very, uh, very clear to me, at least uh, in the Alaskan Arctic. There's many, many different impacts from HABs, and I've only listed a few of them here. Uh, you can see that a number of these are related to shellfish that accumulate, that filter the water, accumulate the algae, uh, eat the algae and accumulate their toxins and resulting in a number of different poisoning syndromes when humans or animals eat those shellfish or fish. The ones that I'll talk the most about here is paralytic shellfish poisoning or PSP. This can be fatal. Uh, certainly can make people very, very ill after eating something as simple as a, a, a plate of shellfish. Uh, but in dashed boxes here, you see uh, an, another syndrome, amnesic shellfish poisoning or ASP, um, which also we now uh, know is a threat to that, these regions, these Arctic regions. This one 
can also be lethal, but another uh, very bad outcome is, is that it, people who are severely poisoned can uh, have permanent uh, short-term memory loss. So basically brain damage from eating uh, shellfish. And that same toxin that's called demolic acid can cause fish and wildlife mortalities. And we therefore call that demolic acid poisoning or uh, DAP. So if you look John, at the worldwide... I'm... Okay. I don't see the arrows yet though. There they are. Got it? Yeah. Thanks, Don. Okay. So I've just described then the, uh, the PSP and the ASP syndromes, but if you look at the global distribution on the left, you see PSP and in the right ASP. PSP, as, as, as Tatiana was saying, is the most globally distributed of all of these uh, HAB poisoning syndromes. Uh, ASP less so, but it's also much more recent. We've only learned about it about 30 years ago. Now, when I see these maps, uh, there's many different things that are interesting to me, but one of the most, in, uh, what I often do, my eye goes uh, up, up there, up to the, the north, to the Arctic, to the Pacific Arctic in particular, uh, where there are no dots and triangles. And the, the question is, are these problems uh, up there? Are the species up there? Uh, or are they, and therefore we're not recording them, or is it that they're, they're not there yet and might be there in the future? And so over the years, there have been a number of, of, of observations that suggest that indeed these toxins and, and, and uh, species are up there. One of the most uh, important of them came out in 2016, Kathy LeFay published this paper and had this map in it that shows you for 13 different species of marine mammals with all their different uh, habitats and, and food, you know, just the types of food they eat. Uh, you can see demoic acid, the ASP toxin and blue is the sax toxin for PSP is very widely distributed in all of these animals, whether they're harvested or, or stranded. We've always known that down in here in the Gulf of Alaska, these uh, HAB problems occurred and even uh, a little further into the, the Bering Sea, but uh, it was really eye-opening to many people to see the, the widespread distribution of these toxins in these mammals well up into the, the Chukchi and even the Beaufort Sea. And that actually was instrumental in helping some of us get funding to try to do this, what we've been trying for years. So uh, basically, uh, to summarize quickly, recent studies have shown that we have HAB toxins in the Arctic. Uh, we know that warming ocean temperatures and decreasing ice cover are going to likely expand that spatial and the temporal windows for HABs in the Arctic. Uh, and therefore, the human health and ecosystem impacts could well be significant in this region for several reasons. The routine monitoring programs for toxins and shellfish in shellfish and fish like we have in much of the rest of the world, they don't exist up there. And, and there appears to be no societal experiment, experience with algal toxins in the food web. So we have a research program that's trying to determine the distribution and the community structure, the dynamics of first Alexandrium catenella, the PSP organism, and Pseudonychia, which is a group, there's multiple pseudonychia species that cause ASP and DSP or DAP in the Bering, Chukchi and Beaufort Seas. And I'll say it here, you'll hear me say it multiple times, it would be wonderful if we could expand uh, the impact of this research through collaboration with uh, our Russian colleagues. So a, a little bit more background. Uh, this is Alexandrium catenella here. These are the vegetative cells and you see the life history of that organism here. And these are the cells that swim around in the water produced toxin photosynthesized. But they originate in cysts that are down here in the sediments. And Tatiana showed pictures also. And these germinate to produce these vegetative cells as we call them. And then they, they form gametes that ultimately make new cysts. And so um, when you're studying this phenomenon, you really need to figure out where the cysts are because it's, it's a huge part of, of the bloom dynamics of this organism. So that's what you see here. This is a one figure that incorporates a huge amount of data from multiple uh, two years and, and, and several cruises. And what you're seeing in co the colors are the cysts in the bottom sediments. So we're now looking down in the mud and quantifying how many cysts are there. And what you see this big hot area with these 
really high concentrations of cysts is what we'd call a, a cyst accumulation zone or a seed bed. Uh, and it, it's very large here. It extends down a little bit into Kotzebue Sound. You don't see very many cysts down here in the, in the Northern Bering Sea. And notice as you head towards the east, uh, it starts to taper off. But we have a second feature here near Point Barrow. Again, very dense concentrations of cysts. And then it, few if any cysts out here in the, in the Beaufort. And there's a, a few things to note. This feature in the US side stretches at least 200 kilometers offshore and 600 kilometers uh, along shore. It's by far the, by a factor of five or six, the largest cyst bed of this organism we've ever seen anywhere in the world. Notice, however, the lack of Russian data out here. It, we clearly didn't sample this whole feature. Uh, the, the, the last uh, stations, we still had high cyst abundance. And, and so another important point is the density of these cysts. So they're massive. This, these are the highest concentrations ever reported. So here we have in this region, the, the largest cyst seed bed with the highest concentrations that we've seen anywhere in the world, as well as the second cyst seed bed over there in, in Point Barrow. Now let's jump up and look in the water column. And what we see there um, is, is, is striking as well. First of all, in 2018, we see here a bloom of these vegetative cells in the surface waters, basically sitting right over that large cyst seed bed that I showed you in the last slide. And you can see very little cells down here in the south and, and few off here to the, to the east and north. And when we saw this, the implication was that that cyst seed bed was the source of this bloom and that it was what we would call a self-seeding uh, or a self-initiating bloom, uh, like we've seen in many other parts of the world. In 2019, the picture is a little bit different though, because yes, we still see some part of a bloom up here in this Ledyard Bay area, but we also then see a bloom that has just been advected through the, the Bering Strait, very high concentrations. Again, these concentrations are easily uh, above levels that cause dangerous toxicity elsewhere in the world. Notice also we did resolve a little bloom right where that uh, Point Barrow cyst seabed is as well in 2019. So together, these all these data suggest that we have two mechanisms for blooms in the region. One where they are uh, coming in from the warmer southern waters and being invected into the region. And there's actually good reason to believe that some of that is coming in from the Russian side of the Bering Sea. And I'll, I just don't have time to get into that. Um, but we have a, a transported or invective mechanism to cause these blooms. And then we have this huge, uh, the, the potential for a, the cyst seedbed to be, to be causing the blooms to originate right there. And I, in the interest of time, I'm not going to uh, talk about uh, or show you any more data slides, but just to summarize the, the, the observations that say we have temperature, bottom temperatures in this region where the cysts are hugely abundant, have increased dramatically over the last decade, three degrees Celsius or, or more. They are now in the range where germination is not only feasible, but actually relatively rapid compared to what we thought was happening a decade or two ago. And the temperatures in the surface waters are also uh, easily supportive of the, the actual growth and division of these populations once they get into the region. So they're not just getting washed up there and not growing, they're, they're, they're actually growing locally as well. So to, to wrap up, I mean, I, I wish I could talk to you about Pseudonychia and other observations, but in the interest of time, I'm just going to say that where, where we go from here, we're going to, over the next several years, continue to collect and process, have samples throughout the region on some of our own cruises and also uh, working with many others, including Jackie and others who've been wonderful getting us samples. Uh, we want to communicate with our Russian colleagues to coordinate similar sampling in these, uh, in the Western Bering and in the Western Chukchi Sea. And together we hopefully can understand and communicate the human health and ecosystem threats from HAB toxins in this, in this Arctic region. And this is especially important given the diverse range of vectors for these toxins that we really don't know 
uh, anything about. And that includes seabirds, walrus, and, and other whales, other marine mammals. And I'll, I'll just stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Don. Um, I'm, I'll wait for questions, that, but I have one until we move on to the next one. And as you know, the question on that map you have for 218, where you have the, your hot bullet in the water column for HABs, is also the lowest benthic biomass of some of the prey that some of these big benthophores. And I was wondering if you think what impact that might have, or speculate on the impact, impact if moving through the, the food web it can have on the, uh, the larger system. So there's, we have a, a, a big project that over the next few years will help us to answer that question. But um, I, there's no, there's no uh, doubt that these toxins can affect certain uh, animals and mammals. Uh, they, we, we know that. We know a lot. We just don't know uh, the, the levels that are lethal, like to a seabird or to mm -hmm. a walrus or to a whale. Um, typically, these animals, therefore, could actually be carrying around low levels of these toxins and therefore be a danger to consumers, whether it be a, a human or, or, or another animal. Um, but in terms of the, the, the other parts of the food web, the fish and so forth, um, what we've found in the past have been that many fish are as sensitive, well, not necessarily as sensitive, but they're sensitive enough to these toxins that they will die before they become dangerous to humans unless you eat their, their stomach contents. But the flesh and so forth doesn't be, be, isn't dangerous. And the, but that the, um, there are certain communities who will eat an entire crab, for example, or, or something else, eating the stomach contents or eat entire fish. And, and then either the animals that do that or the, uh, the humans can, can have serious problems, not because of necessarily the muscle, the, the flesh of the fish and crabs, but because of the other, um, the, the organs. And, and I think forage fish, which are a popular food uh, up in this region, uh, capelin, sand lance, other things uh, are a real risk because people do eat the entire fish. All right, thank you. And there's some questions that are coming in the chat. I'd like to bring them up during the discussion because I think we need to probably move on. So thank you very sure. much, Don. So our final uh, speaker in this session is Andre Vinenkov, and he is the director of the Marine uh, Program at the United Certification Systems Limited Company. And he's gonna speak about the vulnerable marine ecosystems. He is a specialist in ichthyology and, and marine fish, and also into ecosystem dynamics. So uh, I'd like to invite you to speak. Thank you. Andre? Good afternoon to all participants. I was hoping to see my presentation on the screen, if I could. Do we have our Russian speaker back, folks? I mean, our interpreter? Yes, I will be speaking Russian. I would like to greet all those participants in this event. I think it's extremely important. And despite the late hour, I'd like to uh, present myself. I, my name is Andrei Vinikov. I'm the Marines Program Director at United Certification Systems Limited. That's our primary organization, but I'm currently carrying out marine certification here in Moscow. My report was prepared with the help of Ivan Blokin, a senior specialist at the Russian Scientific Research Institute of Fisheries and Oceanography, as well as leading scientist Yelena Arkhipova, who also works at that organization. Here we're talking about uh, vulnerable marine ecosystems in the northwestern part of the Bering Sea. Of course, the Russian portion of these systems. And here, due to marine fishing certification in this area, there has been significant effects 
seen on vulnerable marine ecosystems. And therefore, my report and my presentation are on this issue. Here is the title of my presentation and the authors. Here, I just wanted to qu quickly speak a bit about the schematic map of the Bering Sea. As you know, this is a, a very large uh, fishing zone for both of our countries, for Russia and the United States of America. In the Russian zone, we can see a larger portion of deeper waters and a more narrow shelf. And here we can see the region uh, around the Chukotka Peninsula and the Anadir Bay. And in the southwestern area, you can see the Kamchatka Peninsula, the Commander Basin. On the American side, We'll see uh, a longer shelf, sea shelf that we take up most of the area, but only to the south here, the south western portion is one of deep waters. The overall area of the Bering Sea is more than 2 million square kilometers. Its average depth is uh, 16. Uh, 140 meters, and the deepest point is over 4,000 meters deep. Here we can see some of the biological characteristics of the vulnerable biotopes. That's what we would recommend that these vulnerable marine areas be called. These are the recommendations that we submitted to the UN's FAO. So here I wanted to highlight the most important, which are how unique or rare the biota is, its vulnerability, their sensitivity, or their slow recovery, as well as high biological productivity and their high biological diversity. All of these recommendations were presented for the deep water regions and the open seas in 2012 and their national waters in national waters this was recommended to be uh, c protected in several countries some countries have undertaken measures to identify these vulnerable biotopes and they've carried out some uh, measures to protect them unfortunately in russia there is no single program at the state level to protect these biotopes and they are not included in fisheries or in any other national legislation. Therefore, they are not protected. In Russian seas, we can, in the Bering Sea, there are several groups of vulnerable biotypes. These include immobile species, which include alonaceas, sponges, uh, large corals, and barnacles. There are also mobile filter feeders, as you can see here in the middle, that are vulnerable organisms as well. These include the Gorgonocephalus, which are uh, part of the Afinuridia genus. Each region in the Russian zone was analyzed for the different species that it contained. So a list was made of the species available in each region. The regions were, include the Anadir and Chukotka regions and the Koryask region. In the Koryak region, we saw immobile or semi-mobile cestin species, 
which included Alanaceae, sponges, ascidians, bryozians, barnacles, sea pens, and crinoids. We also saw mobile filter feeders, the gorgonocephalids, and predators, including the Actinicera. We also set up graphs showing the different taxonomies, and we also took a look at their distribution boundaries, depending on which sea areas and sea zones they were located. We also note which groups were, and here on this slide, we see the Anadir region. On this table, we see, oh, I apologize. Let me go back to the previous slide. Here we can see the Chukcha region. And then the next uh, slide is the Anadir region. And here we can also see which groups are found and how they are distributed in the Anadir region. Here we should note that the mobile Gorgonocephalus are seen in the central part of the region along the Anadir current. And we can see several types of ascidians to the southwest coastal line of the Anadir Bay. The sponges are seen both in the northeast bays and the southwest coasts as well. This slide shows a table that includes each of the species and where their distribution boundaries are in the Koryak region, which is the northwestern portion of the Bering Sea. And we also can see that the depth for these animals uh, in this region is divided into three separate regions. So the sponges, the ascidians, and the uh, are seen mostly on the shelf. And then the ophidurea, the sea pens, and the crinoids are seen in the central and eastern sections of the region. And some are seen on both the continental slope and on the, the sea shell. In conclusion, I wanted to note that, um, well, I haven't shown a, a map here seeing the distribution, but if we take a look at it, we can see it's fairly chaotic. It's a mosaic of distribution for these vulnerable species throughout these three regions that I was discussing. And in the Bering Sea, we can see that these megabenthos, both the uh, immobile and mobile megabenthos, they don't have a specific area or common area of distribution. In the study area, the species occupy their own zones specific only to certain species of benthic invertebrates. Another thing that I wanted to note is when we studied the benthos and megabenthos, we don't have a specific specialist who's focused on vulnerable uh, marine biosystem biotopes. And therefore, this is something that needs to be targeted. There needs to be targeted research carried out on this issue. Um, here, I want to talk about different types of fishing gear that's used in this region, including bottom trawling, the Danish seine, a bottom long line. And my last slide are the recommendations for how to uh, mitigate the effects of these types of fishing, this type of fishing gear on vulnerable marine ecosystems. Thank you for your attention and I'm ready to answer any questions you might have. Thank you very much, Andre, for an interesting uh, talk. I find that certain species, I'm a benthic ecologist also, that's my, I look at pelagic benthic coupling and I see that you, these are, a lot of them are suspension feeding organisms. So, you know, my question to you is that are you, as you map these uh, 
uh, organisms and their their locations and then you're having a, are you be able to map over key stressors that would influence their populations and changes and then after this question we'll, we'll just move on to the open session for a large part currently the stressors to these vulnerable populations would be primarily the the fishing gear that's the main issue that we see for example in the bering sea fish fishermen are undertaking voluntary efforts to uh report the depths for their macrobenthus uh, fishing and what apparatus they're using. They're also uh, identifying regions where fishermen, for example, in the Russian Bering Sea, the fishermen are attempting to avoid fishing. So there are protected areas, but only on a voluntary basis. But unfortunately, we yet to we are yet to establish any sort of legal framework for this. So the question of how these rare species will be protected and how their fishing gear will be modernized so that it can uh, avoid any sort of negative effects on these animals. These are things that we still need to study. That would be the end of my question or my answer. It does. Thank you very much on that response. And at this point, I think we have 10 minutes that we can have a open discussions on questions that people have been adding to the, the chat, first chat area. First, I want to thank Tatiana and Dawn and Andre for, for great presentations. Um, from Tatiana, there was a question is, how long have you been collecting and quantifying cysts from the HAB species? And I think you addressed some of it. What are the significant changes in numbers over time? Thank you for the question. Do you mean studying the cysts? Or so the length of time I've been studying the cysts and what kinds of changes we've seen over the time? you know how long have you been has this been going on and and whether or not there's you're seeing changes over that time of your studies uh, i understood we started studying these cysts in 1999 in this region and unfortunately we had no opportunity to be consistent so to carry out monitoring activity because there are many regions that are uninhabited and samples well we gain these samples either due to any a scientific uh, research expeditions or people who collect these samples for us when we we contact them so these events that we are studying are it's it's not something that we can do consistently we only gain data on a regular basis for example at the beginning of the 2000s and then currently due to the events that took place in kamchatka the interest in this issue has become much higher and we've already uh, obtained fall samples from both the Chukchut Chukchut Sea, from the Kamchatka coast and other areas. And we are currently an analyzing these cysts. And we're planning to do so this year. And we are also planning to collect and analyze uh, cyst samples this year to a greater extent and then we'll be able to compare it with the samples we had from the early 2000s but we haven't done this yet unfortunately but this is something that we hope to do in the future okay that that's great because there was a follow-up question is that since it was so unusual the kamchatka 2020 
there, the question was whether there were physical or chemical conditions that, that influenced that being so unusual and do you expect it to happen again? Hang on, I see there's another question. Uh, it, it was a follow-up on your Kamchatka question. <laughs> okay. Sure. Thank you. Um, the another question is, I think, for Don or any of you can answer on the panel is what was that? Does saxatoxin cross the placenta? For example, could it influence gray whale pregnancies? Well, that's a it's a it's a question we can't answer. Actually, it's not known. Uh, whether saxatoxin, that specific toxin, can cross the placenta. We do know several uh, toxins. There, one's called ochodeic acid, another one's uh, ciguatoxin. Ciguatoxin is a tropical uh, fish toxin that, that uh, isn't of concern up in that part of the, uh, of the world, but ochodeic acid potentially could occur. Uh, we know that the species that produce it are, are up there. Those two we know cross the, the barrier. Uh, another one, demolic acid, uh, also crosses that that barrier. I but nothing is known about saxitoxin, and, and it sort of surprises me that I mean demolic acid is also a small molecule like saxitoxin. Um, I, I'm not sure why one would cross and, and not the other, but but officially there's no paper I've ever seen that talks uh, talks about that. So. Uh, Saxitoxin remains a mystery, but I didn't say it, but there's definitely demolic acid. Oh, well, in Kathy Le Fay papers, it's there uh, throughout the Arctic region. All right. Thank you, Don. There's so many great questions, but I'm going to ask one more for Dr. Vinikov, and then we're going to have to move on to the next section. Uh, but there are a lot of um, questions in the chat box, so if you have an opportunity to respond back while we're going through the other talks. But the final question is, what are the possibilities for combining U.S. and Russian trawl data to establish basin-wide distribution in abundance? I already understood the question, and I'll try to answer it here. First and foremost, there must be joint scientific programs that we undertake in both of our countries. In the Bering Sea, there are no open seas, so it would have to be a bilateral agreement. For example, a uh, convention on the Northern uh, Pacific Ocean and fishing in the Northern Pacific Ocean. So what we need to do is develop some joint scientific research projects. And these projects would involve both Russia and the United States, where we could exchange data and uh, establish an overall picture for the Bering Sea as a whole. Uh, so far, I haven't seen any events or any uh, steps in this direction. We also need to work to ensure that there are certifying agencies establish a single methodology that would work both in the American and the Russian uh, waters. That would be my answer. Well, I want to thank you all three of you very much for your response. I'm sorry I can't get to everybody's questions, but we, we need to move on. But I would ask you to look at the chat box and respond if you can. Um, we're going to be moving on to the, the next session, which is the final one on fisheries topics. And our first speaker is going to be uh, uh, Sergei Korostelyev, and he's at the uh, World Wildlife Fund in, uh, in Russia. He is a uh, ichthyologist, a stu uh, uh, studies uh, involved with the Sustainable Fisheries Program for uh, World, Wild World Wildlife Fund, and he will be giving a, a presentation on uh, pollock fisheries in the Russian uh, waters of the Chukchi Sea. Very timely. Thank you. Good afternoon, good evening, colleagues. Yes, indeed, I am a uh, 
colleague from the WWF Russia in Kamchatka in the Bering Sea Eco-Regional Office, and my report is on the plans for a pollock fishery in the Russian waters of the Chukchi Sea. These plans were established fairly recently. I wish to let you know that I used open source for this uh, presentation first and foremost. Uh, there was a 2018 uh, plan uh, that was carried out in by the research vessel Professor Leonidov in the Chukchi Sea, and this research project laid out these crawling sampling sites. And what does this mean? This means that we established that the primarily concentration of Pollock was located in the uh, south of the area of study. These were a large sized Pollock. Uh, in the north, we only saw uh, juvenile fish, those that were less than 17 centimeters long. And the size uh, range of Pollock is reflected in this slide. We see two groups from 5 to 30 centimeters and from 45 to 80 centimeters. The average sized Pollock was missing from these catch records. The group that measured from 11 to 13 centimeters dominated. These were spawned in 2018. The adult pollock group was made up of fish measuring between 53 and 60 centimeters, and they made up 48% of the total. So we would uh, therefore hypothesize that they're primarily nine to 10 year old fish that spawned in 2009 or 2010. We also note here the almost complete lack of mid-length pollock, those aged from four to six years old. They are considered the backbone of Bering Sea trawl fishing. According to experts from the federal state funded research institution of Niro, the abundance and biomass of mature pollock, those exceeding 40 centimeters in length, uh, was 541.1 million fish or 890,000 tons. And the uh, juvenile abundance was at 389 million fish. And these pollock stock estimates were made in the summer of 2019 in the Chukchi Sea. They significantly exceeded those from 2018, seven times higher in abundance and 28 times higher in biomass. In general, the 2018-2019 assessments reflected the fact that the pollock groupings in the southern part of the sea could have been formed due to pollock migration into the region through the Bering Strait from the northern Bering Sea. Only future scientific observations can determine whether this summertime migration pattern will continue. It's also worth noting that no groupings of Pollock constituting recruits, meaning for age three to five, were observed. And this is yet another argument that shows that the local, there is a lack of local regional Pollock stocks in this area. According to assessments in 2021, the commercial Pollock resources in the Chukchi Sea will reach 154,000 tons and will be made up of 87% of older Pollock, those who are over 10 years old. And we expect that when we compare it to 2019, the commercial biomass of Pollock 
will decrease almost sixfold due to the high natural mortality of older pollen. Therefore, the total allowable catch for Pollock in the Church of Sea for 2021 is recommended to be approximately 37,000 tons. Any plans to establish a fishery are currently facing a raft of issues. The first and most important issue is that of an unsustainable resource level. In 2020, the uh, TA was 69,000 tons, but for 2021, it's been halved. The second problem is due to the fact that there is a limited period where a commercial biomass exists in the Chukchi Sea, only from August into September. And the third issue is a limited opportunity to use traditional fishing methods. For example, multi-depth trawling. This is because the biomass forms at a depth of 30 to 60 meters. And therefore, they can only use Danish seine nets in this type of fishery. And but this means that they can only use mid tonnage ships, which don't have onboard processing. And therefore, you would also need to involve a processing vessel. Because of these issues, fishing industry isn't interested in this type of fishery. And until recently, no auctions for these resources to be fished have been announced in the Russian Federation. Whether they will be announced this year has yet to be clarified. Thank you for your attention. That was the end of my presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Sergey. I think what I'd like to do is to move on to the next speaker with Bob Foy. And then since there's only two in this session, then we can have joint questions at the end and people can catch up on asking those questions. So uh, uh, Bob Foy, Robert Foy, he's at the Science and Research Director at the NOAA's Alaska Fishery Science Center. Awesome. And he uh, will be giving a presentation on the topic of um, uh, highlights from the 2021, uh, 2020, the plans for the 2024 21 survey plans for both fish and marine mammals. So, Bob, do you want to start your presentation? Thank you, Jackie. Uh, very much appreciate it. It's extremely exciting to, to go after Andre and uh, Sergey in, in terms of what they showed. Um, and, and thanks very much for the um, uh, folks who have put this together and the great sharing of information today. Uh, really appreciate it. Um, so today, I am going to try and find the next slide. There we go. Today, um, unlike the previous title, I'm going to focus a little more. It is 20 in 20 and 2021, but I'm going to focus in particular on uh, U.S. and uh, Russia collaborations uh, within those uh, research data collections that we have in 2020 and 2021. So I'll start with uh, what is the Alaska Fishery Science Center. Uh, this is the uh, research center for NOAA fisheries in Alaska. We're responsible for the fisheries management, marine mammal conservation, and ecosystem assessments within the one and a half million square nautical miles of federal water around Alaska, including multiple uh, large marine ecosystems as, as shown here. Obviously, we have a lot of reason to um, uh, need and uh, enjoy collaborations with Russia and the Eastern Bering Sea, Northern Bering Sea, uh, Chukchi, etc. Um, and without those collaborations, uh, we really can't have a holistic understanding of the changes that we're observing in our fish distributions, changes that we're seeing in the ecosystems, as we heard in all of the previous uh, presentations. So today I'm gonna to focus on those top three bullets, a commercial fisheries species example, uh, some of the work at the Alaska Science Center on our ecosystem surveys, uh, a joint uh, data collection uh, request uh, and plan moving forward. What I won't be showing are some of the marine mammal collaborations. We heard some of those earlier today. So I'll focus on the fisheries. So this first slide here shows some of our bottom trawl data, uh, our, our, um, our bottom trawl sites. And uh, 
Andre, I'm, I'm particularly interested in talking with you. Uh, Dwayne Stevenson uh, provided uh, that question uh, earlier in, in um, the chat box, and we're very much interested in how we can take the data that we've been collecting uh, for 40 plus years in, in the region and compare them in terms of uh, uh, benthic ecology and, and, and important benthic regions. Um, these uh, trawl surveys, I'm going to start with the bottom figure here. The bottom figure shows the stations, uh, 20 nautical mile station spacing that we've occupied since um, the late 1960s, standardized since 1975 to current in an annual survey. More recently in the Northern Bering Sea here on the upper left, uh, you can see the uh, survey stations that we've, we occupied in 2010. Uh, 17, 18, and 19, and we'll be there again in 2021. Uh, the goal of these surveys, this is a bottom trial survey. Uh, the goal is monitoring uh, the bottom community, uh, ground fish, crabs, um, invertebrates, other organisms, as well as uh, relating that information back to ecosystem um, uh, um, stat uh, status, monitoring, and then ultimately providing this information for stock assessment. This slide shows uh, additional work that we are collecting in this same region uh, focused on temperature and environmental distributions. So uh, this shows uh, the bottom waters, cold in 2010, blue is cold, red is warm. 2017, an intermediate year, and then 2018 and 19 being warm years. And numerous speakers spoke to this today, um, the changing environment. Uh, what I'd like you to focus on on the upper left panel for 2010 is this deep cold water pool. And that has uh, driven a lot of uh, factors associated with production in the region, with distribution and movement. And more recently, we have a better understanding of the uh, implications that that cold water played in terms of a wall limiting movement of some of the gadded species that, that we're now seeing in 2018 and 19. We then, on the right-hand side, you can see the maximum sea ice extent as you would expect uh, based on the, um, uh, the formation of the cold pool, which is a result of the melting of that sea ice for different years, 2010, 17, 18, and, and 19. So directly correlated and, and then correlated to the biology. Uh, this slide shows adult summer pollock distributions and size structure. On the left-hand side, we've got the same years, a cold 2010, uh, intermediate 2017, and then 2018 and 19. Um, these are collaborative projects which are with our Russian colleagues, where we have compared uh, information either from bottom trawl surveys um, or from midwater trawl surveys, as you can see here in the Northwest in 2018. And the goal to get a more holistic understanding of uh, what's going on with the, the Pollock distribution. And again, to tie it into some of what was talked about in previous presentations. You can see in a colder year, a more southerly distribution in 2010 on the left-hand side. 2017, uh, much more movement of these fish into the northern and to the western side of the distribution. And then in 2018 and 19, the data that we have available uh, showing a, a rather dramatic increase in the biomass in the darker areas um, in the northern region. So in thinking about this uh, relative to the, um, the length frequency data that we saw in the previous presentation from the Chukchi, uh, you can see here in 2010 on the left-hand side, this is the northwest on the Russian side on the top than the Northeast and the Southeast. And what we're looking for is any kind of consistency in that length frequency in the different regions. In 2010, we don't see a lot. Uh, the, the, the stocks seem to be separated, not a lot of uh, continuity uh, in the size classes in the different regions. A different story in 2019 on the right-hand side, where you can see the potential for similar size classes in the different regions, um, the potential for different uh, recruiting events into the size classes here, and it will be extremely um, exciting to compare this information to what we just saw from the, the Chukchi Sea as well. Uh, so that northward migration may be related to sea ice and changes in bottom warm, uh, warm bottom temperatures, uh, northward uh, and northward currents. Let me go back. Ooh. So 
Sorry about that. I'm clicking away here. Seems to have a mind of its own. So uh, this next presentation here um, is also on the spatial temporal variability of a number of different transboundary uh, groundfish species uh, based on our surveys. Um, this again is a collaboration uh, with our TINRO colleagues um, and AFSC uh, fishery independent survey uh, scientists in the Bering Sea. And the goal was to better understand what resources are not available in our management schemes. How much movement is happening between these regions and then what is really being represented in, in our uh, ability to manage these stocks and then ultimately to determine if there are oceanographic trends that are correlated to these distributions and these shifts and the methods here are based on uh, survey area swept indices and then also incorporating uh, model indices there we go again Okay, apologize here. Okay, so this slide here um, shows the information from uh, that collaborative effort for pollock on the left, cod in the middle, and place. And on the top row, and I'm looking at the colored slides on the left here, we've got 1982, 1990, 99, 2003, 2012, and 2019. Uh, the scale on here is a little reverse from what we saw earlier in that the lighter color represents a higher density. Uh, so what you can see, let's just look at Pollock on the left hand side. Uh, you can see that the Pollock distribution uh, earlier in the time period, more southerly distribution extending uh, both on the northwest on the Russian side as well as on the US side. And then as you uh, get in more recent years, an increase in that biomass in the Northwest in 2012, 2019, an increase in biomass in the North and in the West. For cod, we see a similar pattern in the middle column here with a higher distribution in the southerly part portion of the distribution um, in the range. And as we move forward in, in years, as you go down the column, you see uh, the, that biomass increase to the north and to the west. Place are a more nearshore distributed species. So early in the distribution, again, you can see a high, uh, a large number of uh, fish in the, in the more in the nearshore region on the US side. As we move forward in time, you see that distribution shift more to the Northwest. Uh, maintaining its relative north-south distribution, but that shift to the northwest. On the right-hand side, uh, showing this a little bit different, uh, this shows the centers of distribution with latitude on the y-axis and year on the x-axis. As you can see for Pollock on the top, a variable but increasing latitude in terms of distribution all the way through to the current year. Similar for cod, maybe a more of a dramatic increase in that distribution in more recent years associated with heat waves, and then place a consistent increase over time, um, uh, maybe not as related to the extreme environmental conditions um, from 1990 to current. So what does this mean for management? Uh, this just shows the eastern side in U.S. waters, and this is focused on the proportion of the overall biomass from the entire Bering Sea, um, the proportion of that biomass outside the eastern Bering Sea. So what are we missing when we're conducting um, our surveys and, and looking to take this information to management? So what you can see in Pollock on the left is that uh, steadily until uh, 2018 or so, we were below 50% of the stock being on the left-hand side, but you can see highly variable. And in fact, the mid-1990s, a point where uh, greater than 50% of the stock was outside of our focused Eastern Bering Sea area. And by outside, this could be to the north, and this could be uh, to the west in Russian waters. For cod, a similar situation where we were um, averaged around 25% of the stock not being in the Eastern Bering Sea, and more recently uh, reaching up towards 75%. Uh, so obviously an extreme shift outside the Eastern Bering Sea in terms of how we manage that for those Eastern Bering Sea fisheries. For place, not quite as variable, but that steady increasing in amount of fish that are not available in the Eastern Bering Sea for management. 
Uh, so this highlights the importance of sharing information across the line, the importance of better understanding uh, recruitment and size structure of what's on the West versus what's in the East. So another pick, uh, slide here focused on ecosystem. Uh, so this is work with our, our colleagues, our Russian colleagues that have come out on our basis surveys, um, and they have conducted all of the work looking at these diets and the Northern Bering Sea in the top and the Southern Bering Sea. And you can't see the legend here, but in essence, what this collaboration has shown us is that the distributions in age zero Pollock diets on the left-hand side here in the Northern Bering Sea have shifted in the last 10 years from small copepods to being dominated by euphausids and more recently large copepods and amphipods. In the Southern Bering Sea, a similar shift in diet distribution from small copepods uh, to larger copepods in more recent years, obviously variability there. Juvenile pink salmon, also part of this study in the Northern Bering Sea. And here we saw a shift from um, fish pollock diets being, uh, fish pollock dominating the diets of juvenile pink salmon um, to euphausids, larger copepods, and in more recent years, amphipods playing an important role in, in 2019 in particular. So again, an excellent example of, of working together and collaborating on, on data um, and, and the need for more data in the West here. Um, another study, uh, we saw some of the uh, survey lines in previous presentations here um, in this upper Northwest region, a collaboration as part of the US-Russia Intergovernmental Consultative uh, Committee. Uh, the goals uh, to conduct surveys and ecosystem research activities to understand structure, function, and ecology in the region, focusing on a number of different species. And you can see some pictures here of our, our colleagues on the Russian side. And just some initial data here. These are acoustic data on the left-hand side showing gadded abundance shifting in 2017 from high biomass to lower biomass in 2018 and 19. Fits extremely well with the Chuck Chi C story we were just hearing um, uh, earlier today. And on the right-hand side, this just shows the difference between 2017 and 2019 and the shift in, in Arctic gadded species. Um, between the two years when one was warmer and one was south, uh, one was cooler. And then lastly, I'll wrap up. This is my final slide. Um, just a, a plea to work together and to identify um, uh, cooperative relationships, to identify uh, resources and way that we can uh, identify basin-wide spatial dynamics, uh, basin-wide uh, on a genetic uh, information and migrations, and then lastly, species diversity. All right, Bob, thank you very much for a great talk. Um, what I thought I'd do is open up for a few questions. We're gonna hang on and keep the, the channel open for the question period. And then uh, Margaret will do a final wrap up uh, on this. But I think this question is, uh, it was for Sergey, but I think Bob, you can play into an answer too. And that is, the question is, are you recognizing spawning grounds for Pollock in the Russian zones of the Chukchi Sea? or all the specimens of Pollock in that area in the Chukchi migrants from the Bering Sea. And so I think it's not just the Eastern side of the Chukchi, it's the West, it's not just the Western, but the Eastern. So if both of you can say something about where are these, where's no, the no spawning idea. for these I'll, fish and I'll so forth, it. I'd appreciate it. Let Thanks. me try to answer. I think, or rather, in my opinion, the Pollock that we see in the Chukchi Sea are migrants from the Bering Sea. This is why it's a very short period of time when we can see a commercial biomass in August and September, and we know that it's older uh, Pollock, and we also know that these uh, older pollock are ground fish and they mainly feed on benthos and the spread of benthos is the reason why they migrate 
to the Chukchi Sea in the summertime because of this benthos that also moves north. I have yet to see any spawning grounds for Pollock in the Chukchi Sea at all. In the fall and winter, they move travel back to the Bering Sea and only come back the next summer. And uh, any juvenile Pollock, they are generally uh, affected by the tides. They eat plankton and therefore they migrate with the plankton. They migrate north in the summer to the Chukcha Sea. And then in the cooler weather, they travel back to the Bering Sea. That would be the end of my answer. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Bob, do you have some comments? I do. Thanks, Jackie. And, and I would, I would uh, absolutely agree with Sergey in terms of what we have seen thus far. There appears to be quite a bit of correlation in the Chukchi with the heat wave events and a, a massive movement, a large scale movement due to those events. Um, and unfortunately, we're not monitoring at a scale to really detect the spawning uh, locations in the question, to, to know whether or not there are adults uh, staying in that region, whether or not we can expect those uh, um, uh, stocks to remain and, and um, uh, proliferate into the future. Having said that, there is anecdotal information uh, from coastal communities that we are still seeing gadids, pollock and cod, in those northern areas that we hadn't seen prior to the uh, heat waves. And um, the, the suggestion then that there's a potential for spawning aggregation. So I, I think that still will need to play out in, in the coming years. All right, thank you very much. Are there any other questions uh, that like to be brought forward to uh, Sergey or Bob right now? I don't see them in the chat. And I modified that last one. I'll add one quickly, and and I know there's the compliments coming in. I just wanted to ask, um, when you're going out on these fish fishing or in the plan the planned Russian fishing and the and the U.S. fisheries, are there what are the core environmental parameters collected that can help you in your stock assessment? Just to just very briefly, are you doing TNS and or uh, temperature salinity on the Russian side, just like the American side? Quick answer. <laughs> then I'm going to move it to Margaret. Uh, well, in order to plan a fishery, what we would need are yearly research projects being carried out or surveys, because in 2019 and 2018, we could see a significant difference in the biomass that was surveyed. And uh, although the older pollock, even if it stays in the Chukchi Sea, then it, it, there's a natural die off that occurs quite quickly. So what we would need to carry out are yearly surveys if we are actually planning on opening a fishery. There needs to be a very quality uh, scientific research that's carried out in the area. Thank you. Bob, any last comments before I move it to Margaret? No, I would just agree that the key now is is monitoring to see how these extreme events are, are going to, to continue to play out in the region. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much for uh, all the different sessions and presenters. And I'm going to pass the baton to you, Margaret, for the closure. Are you there? Great. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. I'm here. Great. Well, we have still a hundred people who are sticking with us going into the third hour. So thank you, first of all, to all of you enthusiastic participants. We started with 200 people. And uh, I want to thank our wonderful interpreters and uh, really to invite, we, we hope that this will be the first of a series this coming year. There are so many interesting topics and important themes and ways to share information. So we'd like to, to help catalyze more conversations.
So if, if you have ideas on how we can do this better or another themes that you'd like to hear about, please let us know. And um, I think that's all. Just on behalf of World Wildlife Fund and the Alaska Ocean Observing System, thank you very much to our, pres our presenters, especially those who have, uh, some of them have already gone to bed because it was in the middle of the night in St. Petersburg. Um, but it was a lot of fun. And um, I really think this is so important. It's an exciting and important time to be working across these boundaries. So thank you all. <laughs>